He got beat. He got beat. He got beat by his own son. He got beat. He got beat. He got beat by his own son. He got beat. Bum, 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 bum. This is a video essay about the 1997 Harmony Korean film, Gummo, which I saw in 1997 at the Prince Charles Cinema in London. At time of recording, the Prince Charles Cinema has two screens, a downstairs and an upstairs. Capacity of 300 in the downstairs, 104 capacity in the upstairs screen. But in 1997, Prince Charles Cinema only had one screen, which seated 631 people. Please remember this number because we're going to come back to it. Now, shortly before seeing Gummo, I saw two other other films at the Prince Charles Cinema and the experience of seeing them there, or rather the behaviour of the audience, is what I want to talk about today. So let's go. The first of these films was Russ Meyer's Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens, which I went to see at the invitation of two female friends. They wanted to see it because they were both big fans of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and I am now going to be a little bit more honest with you than I was with my two friends. You see, I did not really like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. It's fine, it's just not really my kind of film. So I wasn't all that excited by the prospect of seeing something similar to it, but my two friends were really excited, so I kind of went along with it all. At the time of this 1997 screening, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls was the only Russ Meyer film that any of us had ever seen, so we had no idea what to expect. Ultra Vixen started, and as it went on, both friends became more and more, mm, let's say, disappointed. But why? Possibly because the film wasn't like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which is what they were expecting. We were sitting in the front row, but we still noticed a number of people leaving during the screening from the exit to the right of the screen, just in front of us. And at the end of the film, we turned around and saw that a healthy number of the crowd had left during the film. Not a huge number of people, people, but definitely what you might call a fair few. So let's imagine that instead of 631 people remaining in the cinema, there were about 530 approximately. I was not doing a head count at the time. The second film I saw at the Prince Charles in 1997 that's relevant to my gummo experience was the 1972 John Waters film Pink Flamingos, and I 100% knew what I was getting myself into with this one. I took a friend to see the film with me, he had no idea what was about to happen. If you haven't seen Pink Flamingos, it is a film about a battle to be crowned, the filthiest person alive. The film is an exercise in bad taste or trash. It features a number of scenes showing things that you really just don't see in movies, either before or since. It is a very fun and very extreme experience. As Pink Flamingos played out, a very sizable chunk of the audience left. Easily over 100 people, if not more. But why? My guess is that in 1997, John Waters was possibly better known for films like Hairspray, Crybaby, maybe even Serial Mum, films which are far glossier, much less extreme than the films he started his career with. My assumption here is that the audience were anticipating a different John Waters experience to the one that you get when you watch Pink Flamingos. I could be wrong, but that's how it felt. And by the end of the film, the audience has shrunk from, oh, let's say 631 to about 480. Which brings me to Gummo. In 1997, Harmony Kareen wasn't really a household name. He was only really known for writing the script to the Larry Clark film Kids. Harmony Kareen is what I'm going to call a Scooch older than me. So him writing and directing his own film felt very much like someone of my own age or generation releasing a film, which felt kind of exciting. Kind of a for us, by us vibe. I don't think I'd really seen anything else made by someone who I would have called my generation by that point. And when I say my generation, what I mean is Generation X. Now, I'm not 100% for the concept of dividing people into discrete groups. Discrete spelled D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E, -E, meaning separate or distinct. I prefer to think that we're all just people. At the same time, we do undergo formative experiences created by the world around us as we grow up, and the world around us back then was different to today. So there are a few characteristic elements used to describe Generation X that I do recognize. So let's take a look at these and let's remember that, like everything else, this is in broad strokes. For those who don't know, Generation X is a name given to people who were born between 1965 and 1980, approximately. It is a very, very thin slice of the population of the world, and there are amazingly, far fewer Generation X people than Boomers, Millennials, or Generation Z. It is often described as the forgotten generation or the whatever generation. Generation X is characterized as being cynical, independent, and apathetic. Wonderfully, in France, Generation X is referred to as Generation Buff, with Buff being a noise meaning whatever in France. Isn't that great? Generation X grew up with MTV, AIDS, the crack epidemic, the rise of home computing, all the good things, and are often characterized as being particularly fond of independence, possibly because of their status as latchkey kids, which came about following an expectation that they would come home to an empty house and have to fend for themselves. That last point is completely true, for me at least. I used to go 
weeks without really seeing an adult when I was younger. I don't think I ever had a conversation about what do you want to do in the future, or how are things going at school. I simply existed, and adults existed around me. So yeah, sure, maybe growing up like that will stick with you. What it definitely resulted in with me was a general disdain for structures and systems. A lot of systems seemed to me a bit rigid and rigged, with little possibility to change, so I found consolation on the fringes, whether that was through music, literature, art, or film. Grunge music, punk, and hip-hop became very important. Literary figures like Jay McInerney, Brett Easton Ellis, and Elizabeth Wurzel were household names for my friends. In visual art, the young British artists, or the YBAs, were absolutely monumental. Monumental, and any film that detailed life as far away from Disney as possible was what I was looking for. And that kind of film often didn't have a clear cut genre category, which kind of brings me back to Gummo. So, 1997, The Prince Charles Cinema. We're there finally, people. I took my seat to watch Gummo. Unusually for me, I sat towards the back of the cinema, principally because the place was packed, barely any seats left. And then the film started. From my vantage point at the back of the cinema, I could see all the silhouettes of people leaving, and they they left in droves. To this date, I have never seen such a large number of people leave a cinema. This is a complete guess, but it went from around 631 people to about 150, maybe even less. Far less than half the audience remained by the end of the film. So why was everyone leaving? I often attribute mismatched expectations as the root of most causes of upset in the world. So that's what I'm going to start with. If the Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens crowd were expecting something more like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and the Pink Flamingos crowd were expecting a glossier John Waters experience, what might the Gummo crowd have been expecting? In what way was their expectation not met? Now, I do not think that everyone in the cinema that day was a die-hard Larry Clark fan. A fair few of them probably had seen kids, but I don't think that's the main reason here. What I do think they might have been expecting was a story, and there is no clear storyline to Gummo. People often cite the importance of stories when they talk about films. People like Robert McKee have made an entire career out of it. But what I often think people overlook when they talk about film is not necessarily story, but moments. For an example of this, let's talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark. We all remember the general shape of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana Jones is looking for the Ark of the Covenant. He meets Marion, goes to Egypt, staff too long, digs the Ark up, snakes, gets the Ark stolen, ends up on an island somehow, match shot of crates. But that's not what we love about Raiders. What we love is the moments. You throw me the idol, I throw you the whip, bad dates, that gunshot, him swinging across a pit, the lines on the map, snakes, why did it have to be snakes, getting hit in the chin with a mirror, pulling down all the baskets. The moments in Raiders are just as much a part of why we love it as the story. And in a way, they are the nodes on the map that we use to remember and talk about the film. Which brings me to Gummo. Because while Gummo does not have a story, what it does have is moments. The rabbit boy on the bridge, the kids on the bike, Harmony Korean's cameo, the man wrestling a chair, the girl shaving her eyebrows, the two brothers fighting, the cockroaches behind the painting, all those damn cats. Gummo is a waterfall of moments. With a real shout out to the guy wrestling a chair scene, I think it's most definitely the best man wrestling a chair scene in the history of cinema. Not enough people talk about this. The film is a mood piece, more of a film about a place and the people in it than a film about a story. Set in Xenia, Ohio, but filmed in Tennessee, our guides through this location are two kids, Tumblr and Solomon, who shoot cats, sell the dead bodies, spend the money they make on glue. In addition to not really having a story, Gummo also doesn't have a clear-cut genre. Yes, it's a drama, but when we think of drama, we often think of something with slightly different beats to Gummo. So yes, drama, but not exactly. Instead, Korean cinema reminds me of that moment in the story of film where Mark Cousins talks about Goddard. Goddard's use of the jump cut on Abu Souf, or Breathless if you prefer, was, to some extent, driven by the fact that the original cut of Abu Souf was too long. Maybe it's because he used short ends of film, it depends who you're listening to here. The best way to make a film is to go with what's available. So, Goddard ended up with too much footage and had to cut back. Or he ended up with short pieces of film, depending on whose story you believe. Instead of removing scenes and keeping his long takes intact, he keeps all of the scenes and just goes with ultra short takes. And to really lean into this, he forgoes match cuts and continuity editing and embraces the jump cut. Mark Cousins summarized this as Goddard saying, I think this moment is beautiful. And that sentence 
sentiment, in my opinion, crosses over into the cinema of Harmony Korine. Gummo is a love letter to the people who inhabit a way of life which is different to the norm and to the places where these ways of life happen. Gummo is also a love letter to performance. Following Gummo, Green made several other feature films and what ties all of these films together, amongst other things, is a focus on people performing. Each of his subsequent films contains a sequence where somebody performs and by that what I mean is that there is a break from the story that the film is telling so that the character can step outside of the idea of a story and embark on a performance piece, which is most usually a song and or dance number. Special shout out to the Julian Donkey Boy rap scene. In Gummo, these performance pieces include a stand up routine and a dance sequence as well as others. <laughs> I saw a man lying in the street, and I said, can I help you? He said, no, I just found a parking space. Now I sent my wife to go buy a car. It's just murderous what's going on with people these days. And the reason I'm highlighting these moments is because I feel like their existence might encourage people to forget that the entire film is a performance piece. It's all a performance. None of this is real. Kareem's films are also often maligned for being depressing or exploitational, but in a way, they're really just love letters to something different. Love letters to people who don't usually get to appear in films. Love letters to the idea that films can be something else. And if you are someone who likes things which are a bit different, if you are a person who doesn't usually get to appear in films, this kind of thing comes back to the for us by us thing I was mentioning earlier. I will never know for sure why so many people walked out of the screening of Gummo I attended in 1997, but I'm damn glad I stayed in my seat, and I'm damn glad there are people out there who recognise that the system of filmmaking is a bit rigid, who identify that these systems are set in stone and are still eager to do something a bit different. The next time you find yourself about to get out of your cinema seat and leave, or even to turn off a film at home, I would encourage you to just wait, see what happens, because you never know when you might encounter your own version of the 1997 Prince Charles screening of Gummo, whatever it might be. Life is beautiful. Really it is. Full of beauty and illusions. <laughs>